Welcome back to Quebec Corner. My name's Connor and today we're going to be going over everything we know so far about the dungeons and zone names in Hytale. There are quite a few zones to go over and quite a few dungeons that we've had sneak previews of, so let's jump right into it. Orbis is the name of the starting planet we seem to have been shown the most of so far. The world is made up of at least six zones, as you can see they all have different weather conditions, terrain, and varying aesthetic, presumably even challenge level the further you progress. Each zone also appears to have a couple of native species that you can interact with along with unique dungeons and lore which I was more than excited to discover. The first zone is called the Emerald Grove, presumably due to all its luscious green environments. The name was recently mentioned on a blog post and was also referred to on the Void Spider dungeon graphic. The Emerald Grove is a really vibrant take on the classic RPG worlds we've grown to know and love. There's trees, mountains, rivers spread across the land and numerous wooden and stone structures referred to as towers. This is where you'll begin your journey in Hytale, surely completing your first quest and earning new rewards. The area is designed to showcase the atmosphere and immersion that Hytale can provide, starting with the classical woodland areas that host the human farmyards. Seemingly, these are quaint settlements and homesteads, simple folk with simple needs, probably learning the basics of the game here. Now, if you venture forth, you're going to discover more life at the edges of the rivers and the grasslands before reaching the more forested areas. These biomes seem to transform overnight, beaming with illuminescent foliage and plant life. The moon sets the tone for a fantastical image, and it's one of my favourite areas revealed so far, I really can't wait to get into it. Animals in this zone definitely range on the tamer side, with farm critters, deer and boars all being shown off so far. The Emerald Grove is home to quite a number of races or NPC factions. Meet the Quebec. If you didn't already realise, these adorable little things are what this channel is named after, and they appear to settle by rivers and more swampish marshy lands, and are apparently one of the earliest allies in the game. There are also two other similar races that exist in what appears to be a similar biome. The Slothians, which are actual sloths, not gonna lie, I really want to see what a sloth paladin would look like and an unnamed species that I'm dubbing the Murlocs, as the scaly amphibious humanoids are similar to a mob of the same name from World of Warcraft. Speaking of Warcraft, Trorks appear to be the main foe of the Emerald Grove. These orc-inspired creatures are at war with the Quebecs. The two races have definitely had some history, be it over territory or the Trorks just being straight up bad guys, but I can definitely see the main storyline quest leading you through their rivalry and explaining it further. Trork camps appear to inhabit the deeper forests and towers, but more on those guys in my upcoming Races and Creatures video. Overall, the Grove looks to be a fascinating place to begin Hytale and, as displayed in the graphic, holds hidden portal dungeons that undoubtedly will test the player's ability. While in a portal dungeon, you are also limited to what blocks you can break and use. These entrances can take all sorts of forms, but the one we're looking at today is the Temple of Gaia, which seems to be a white marble or white rock structure leading to a portal. The instance seems to be made up of two sections, the temple itself and the Garden of Elements. Now, Gaia is said to be the protector of Orbis, keeping the elements within balance, and the main problem with this dungeon is that it's being attacked by some sort of corruption. We can assume that this corruption is some form of the Void, the sixth and darkest element in the world of Orbis, perhaps an attack by the Dark Varen himself. What we do know is the Quebex will be there to guide us through and help defeat the corrupt giant at the centre of the garden. I also wanted to take a look at the map a little longer, focusing on some of the icons and UI. So from what we can see here, dungeons tend to have multiple objectives within them. The Temple of Gaia has subsections, like the Garden of Elements, and as we can see, the main objective here is to defeat the Golem. The UI heavily features player markers, and we have an actual legend that tells us some more details about these icons. So first off are story dungeons, and these will probably tie into the larger picture of the zones and world of Hytale, allowing you to progress further in the storyline and encounter more races. Next up we have a marker for the world dungeons, which seem to be more about the world in general or the zone that you particularly inhabit. I'm not necessarily sure what this could mean, but the fact that you have different types of dungeons within a dungeon is pretty crazy. The Temple of Gaia itself is shown on this legend, however it's not displayed anywhere in the map, which could hint to a possible other subsection of this dungeon. The World Gate is assumably the area that you exit the dungeon from, and the spawn point is exactly where you arrive. There's points of interest that also include multiple sections of lore and loot, and there's waypoints that you can set to actually find specific things. The only other dungeon we currently know of in the Emerald Grove is related to the Void Spider, possibly a lair or cavern of some kind, but that's about it for now. 
The second zone of Orbis is a wasteland of sand mixed with luscious savannah, and from what I've read, it's known as the Howling Sands. Just one look at the artwork and trailer footage, and you can tell that this place is going to be a little bit more difficult. A sprawling land of unique terrain, the animals that thrive here include antelope and saber-toothed tigers. Apparently the sabers will actually be able to hunt the wild antelope without any player intervention, which I'm actually really excited for, and apparently you'll need to train a bit before you can hunt them yourself. It seems that the humans also inhabit this zone and probably recur throughout the majority of Orbis. These structures are more of a military outpost, however, hinting at the dangers that lie ahead in the sands. That brings us to our two main races of this region. First off are the Deadly Scarax. These overgrown hive minds come in all shapes and sizes, with each type descending from a larva hatched by the brood mother itself. It seems that these creatures also work in colonies and inhabit numerous abandoned structures throughout the zone. Being the dubious creatures that they are, they've also previously enslaved another race of Orbis. The Ferens are an adorable set of furry critters that seem rather fond of piercings. They wear braces with the insignia of freedom or wind to remind them of the previous tribulations being enslaved. This could hint at a wider story for this zone, potentially culminating in an assault on the Sand Empress. The Sand Empress is another faction that was revealed in an earlier graphic. And whoever she is, she could potentially hold control over all of the Skarix, or perhaps something even more deadly. Either way, that's about as much as we know for Zone 2. Moving on to Zone 3, Boria. Now, you might be asking where I got this name, and if you take a look at the Hytale blog titled World Gen Introduction, we can see images of zones by a line that reads, Exploring a cave in Boria will be very different from exploring a cave in the Emerald Grove. The only two images above that line of text and in that section of the article is of Zone 1, of course, being the Emerald Grove, and the second image, which logically would be Boria, and that's a pretty cold-sounding name if you ask me. What we've seen from Boria so far, there's a lot to be excited for. Frost giants that can hurdle landmass, our first look at a Zone 3 mount, and there's also a few polar bears that have a really cute swimming animation. An ice dragon has, of course, also been teased. Where and when this will show up, however, is yet to be determined. The region of Boria seamlessly transitions from frosty snowbound plains to rich wooded tundras. With the nighttime ambience and Borealis style lighting, this place is sure to be a treat. And fingers crossed for dwarves, right? It looks like you'll also be encountering some more void creatures here as you explore the depths and further outreaches that seem to have been corrupted. These are supposedly the Outlanders, and while we can't really make out if they're human or not, we can assume that one race in Boria will be the Fawns. Not only is their emblem on the graphic of races, but an image that I believe to be a Fawn Hunter controlling white wolves was shown off a while back. Whether you're helping the Fawns to fight the corruption or something completely unrelated, it looks very interesting. Even the ice dungeons seem far more threatening with their jagged icicle look. Now, this one's only a theory, and I could definitely be wrong about this, and even all the names of the zones, but I believe that Zone 4 is going to be named something along the lines of Devasted or Devastated Lands. On the website, they released an image that outlines the layers of Zone 4 caves in a way that hasn't been done before. You can see that Layer 0 is called the Devasted Lands, and that could mean Devasted, or it could be shorthand for Devastated, but either way, I'm going to use this as the name for now until the real one is revealed. We can actually see the procedural evolution of the cavescape as it transitions from Slothian villages to dinosaur infested jungles, some of which we get to see an actual concept art for. As for the Slothians, this may actually be the race's true home, and the footage we see has a very dark toned sky and these could be caves that hold jungles, and it makes sense that there'd be ponds and trees there as well. From the surface, Zone 4 looks riddled with magma, fire, and ash, with molten ember wolves and more advanced skeleton archetypes to combat, but it seems that ironically environments beneath the ground have just as much to offer, if not more. We don't have any other solid evidence to confirm what dungeons may lie in wait for Zone 4, but this image could potentially tease a boss battle, and we could see the appearance of the Void Dragon from the trailer as well, but it all gets quite mysterious from there. That brings us to about all that's been announced. The ocean could technically be considered a zone, and is promised to be outreaching and potentially infinite. There's a vast array of sea life on show, from tropical and puffer fish to clams, hammerhead sharks, a potential giant squid, and even more murlocs as we glimpse a crashed pirate ship. Sailing could potentially be a feature in Hytale. We occasionally see footage of pirate-style Caribbean islands with a parrot, and even a telescope, as spotted by Emma Littlewood. This could be a way to reach off-coast secrets or even randomly generated sea dungeons. 
So far, it's been established that each zone will have randomly generated coastlines, while the ocean itself will hold multiple biomes and ecosystems. Wrapping up, I just wanted to take a look at the two unannounced zones. Now, it would make sense that there's only six regions in Orbis, as there's six elements. If you include the void, that is. That brings me to my next theory. As we've seen, each zone has some elemental aspect to it. We definitely see ice or water in zone 3, while zone 4 definitely suggests fire. I'm struggling to decide, but zone 1 could very well be earth due to the emphasis on nature and wildlife, while zone 2 could represent wind. The only reasoning I have behind this one is because the Ferens use the freedom symbol. It also appears as if the danger of each element increases with the zone. If this is the case, it would make sense that the next two zones complete the cycle. Lightning would logically follow, with Void being the final area, and what happens to be within the clouds covering Zone 5? Lightning. Looking ahead, you can see Zone 6 is nearly entirely engulfed in purple clouds, and we know the Void is said to be represented by purple from everything we've seen so far. So, who knows? That's pretty much everything I have for you right now. I'm sure I've missed a few things here and there, but I'll let you know if I was wrong about anything incredibly vital. We got a lot of support on the first video, and I really appreciate all the feedback. So, thanks again for watching Quebec Corner. Stay free, and keep safe.